Good to see so many of you out there today. I, uh, the scripture this morning is going to come from uh, Luke, uh, I think it's uh, 13, um, and you've got that in your, in your bulletin also. Um, as, as we were going through uh, looking at getting ready for Easter, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to, to look at the parables of Jesus, so we've been doing that you know, week by week. What has been interesting to me, um, none of the parables I hadn't read before, yeah, duh, uh, but it's, it's, it's really neat to be reading them and, and realizing there's, there's more there than, than meets the eye. Uh, how, how many people here um, tune in and, and watch the, uh, uh, on the Ch- Shore Church Media YouTube channel? watch the sermon preview week by week. People do that? Okay. So as Dr. Watson said this, uh, this last week, uh, sometimes what Jesus says is confusing. Um, and and it's, it's just interesting uh, looking at this. So, so for instance, uh, we're going to have a parable about a mustard seed, and we're going to have a parable about leaven. And in my mind, I always thought, same thing. They're not the same thing. There's actually different meanings that, that happen out of, out of each parable. Uh, I'm a little, uh, little older than Nick. Been reading the Bible longer than Nick's been alive by a long shot. And I didn't realize that until I was studying it for, for this sermon. So, so there. It's like, it's like yeah, you, you always learn the more you study, the, the more you're there. Um, so, so let me just throw something out there, uh, which I, I, I do think happens to be in both parables, and it's that idea of something small, and then it turns out to be something uh, a lot bigger. Uh, a couple ways to look at that. Uh, number one, um, if, if you know me at all, you, you know that I do enjoy doing um, home improvement projects, and over the years I've, I've, I've done my share of them. Um, we are... So back at, at home right now, we're, we're renovating our, a bathroom. And when I say renovate, that's like, like with a capital R and everything else is capital T. I mean, it's like gutting the whole entire room. It didn't start out that way. It started out with me thinking the floor needed to be changed and then having a couple people in the house tell me, well, the vanity really needs to be changed too. And then say, well, I think we're allowed to paint. And then it's like, don't we think we ought to have a shower over that tub? And to the point where all of a sudden it's like, you mean we can't even keep the tub? We have to change. So, so like it started small and got a whole lot bigger. Okay, I don't really think that's what's, what the parable is talking about, but is that, that's kind of the idea. And, and I would say this too. In that whole thing, um, that's overwhelming to me to think about gutting the entire thing and then doing, um, I guess, you know, I did. I did electrical and plumbing and floor and, you know, tiling and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, where, where's Gary Nisley? Hats off to you, bud. Those 50-pound mortar bags, oh, my word. Okay, right, right, right. So, but in, a, in any big project, you don't tackle the whole thing at once. You go piece at a time, piece at a time. A couple months later or whatever, you know, hopefully you, you arrive at a finished product. And I do think that's definitely in these two, two parables. Now, the other thing I would just think of when just, just starting out here is, is this. I think sometimes, at least for myself, and I'm, I'm going to guess for most everybody out there, we look at the world, you know, the whole picture, and we think, I can't stop the killing and the genocide that's happening over in Rwanda. I, I just can't. There's nothing I can do with that. Uh, I don't even know if I can stop the racism and violence and injustice. I, mean, so look, I can't touch those things. So I think it's easy to start thinking, well, what can I do? Or what difference can I make? And I do think the scripture is going to touch on, on that. Sometimes we can, we can think, well, does it matter what I do concerning a whole bunch of other people out there? Well, 
in this, uh, in this scripture where Jesus is going to tell a parable about a mustard seed and leaven, first there's something that happens and there's this, this basically it's a healing story. And because of the healing story and because of the reaction of people around him, then Jesus tells these two parables. So we're going to look at that healing story because that sets the stage for why does he even tell these two parables, which sound a lot alike but have sort of a different, different meanings. So the title of the message this morning is Making a Difference One by One. And we're going to start by looking at the scripture. And again, this will be in your bulletin. I'm going to look at Luke 13. I'm going to look at 10 through 17. I'm using the Christian Standard Bible. Um, there's, there's a variety of reasons. If you know me, I, I, I switch up Bible translations sometimes just because of the, the, the meaning that's out there. So here we go. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, There are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites! Doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated. But the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. Now, a few things just to recognize here. Jesus walks into this synagogue and immediately recognizes there's a spiritual battle going on with the woman or a spiritual battle going on for this woman. And, and it's important. And, and here, this is the Holy Spirit. There, there's, uh, nobody, nobody knew I was going to be talking about bondage and deliverance until uh, I did on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, but that's part of the, the songs that were picked this, this week because... That's important to understand. So Jesus recognized there's this spiritual battle going on. How does he know this? Well, he sees a, a physically bent over, doubled uh, over woman. Um, says so she has a disability or she is disabled and there's a spirit of disability there. Or uh, He recognizes because he's in tune with who God is. Is the woman bent over from a physical cause or emotional cause or a spiritual cause? In one sense, it doesn't make any difference for me to know that. But Jesus knew that. Note what's going on here. It is the Sabbath. They are in a synagogue, which was their place of worship. And so this is the perfect place and time to free the woman from spiritual bondage. Jesus sets the tone for what must happen on the Sabbath. This verse. Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? What's really interesting in, in that, that verse, there's a Greek word that's used there. And in that, in that sentence, it means necessary or obligatory. Okay, This means Jesus felt like he had no choice but to heal the woman and set her free on the Sabbath because that's what you're supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. Okay, so, so uh, let's, let's look at this. Look at what happens when Jesus comes to her aid. This is verse by verse. The woman is healed. Then he laid his hands on her and instantly she was restored. The woman praises God and glorifies God. Then he laid his hands on her and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. Then she is free of what kept her enslaved. Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And then the last thing, she is refreshed, and the people around her are refreshed. When he had said these things, all, all his adversaries were humiliated. 
but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. So evidently, every Sunday morning, these are the kinds of things that are supposed to happen. You know, when, when, when you're at church and you're worshiping, this is what's supposed to be happening. So in your, uh, well, yeah, here, here. So you've got these things that are supposed to happen. Praise and worship, healing, freed from bondage or evil, refreshment and restoration. Those are the things that are supposed to happen when you come to church and worship God. All, all of those kinds of things. And that's what comes out of this story. This is what Jesus was saying. If, if you picked up a bulletin day, I, there's the first fill in the blank is this one. We praise God for who he is. And who he is is someone who does not want any of his children or any of his creation to be held in bondage. And, and again, uh, just, just to say a, a word about, well, what kind of bondage are we talking about here? Okay, there's an awful lot of different kinds of bondage. You can have racism, violence, uh, prejudice. You can have, you can have uh, be bound by your possessions, by, by your selfishness. There are so many things out there that can hold you in bond, enslave you from being the person that God has created you to be. And God doesn't want that for you. So when Jesus comes into a, into a setting, he's like, there's somebody who's held in bondage. That person needs to be delivered. And that takes place on church, in, in, in church. I mean, that's supposed to happen when you come to church. You're supposed to be able to be freed from those, those kinds of bonds. So again, that, the second fill in the blank would be this. Jesus frees us from bondage. There's all kinds of bondage out there. I mean, I named some. There's a lot of, you know, the critical spirit, you know, hatred, uh, unforgiveness. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there that can enslave each and every one of us. We don't have to be enslaved to those things. We get enslaved to those things when we allow the enemy access to those emotions in our life and those thoughts. But we don't have to be enslaved, and Jesus can free us, and we need to recognize that. Okay, so... Here, let's continue on just thinking about this, this first part of this, this healing story. So in this, in this setting, Jesus is going to heal one woman in the, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Okay, so listen, listen. There's one action in one synagogue to one woman on one Sabbath, and it gives one victory. And it sets the stage for others to realize, oh, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, leadership team, we've been reading a book for the last uh, f few months. Uh, the name of the book is Four, F-O-R. And, and one of the things we would have just recently talked about, and it's a quote from the book, do for the one what you want to do for the many. I mean, you don't have time or resources to do it for everybody, but, but if there's one person, I'll do it for that one person. Jesus is doing that. Here, listen. When he came to earth, he did not heal everybody on the planet. He did not even heal everybody in Israel. He didn't. He just didn't. There's a couple times where the disciples say, hey, come on back. We've got more people. He's like, well, no, it's time to move on. So Jesus didn't heal everybody. And when he walked in there, there other stuff going on in there. Well, I don't know. But in the spiritual realm, the spiritual battle, he picked, he picked one person and he made a difference for that one person and set the stage for telling us this is how you're supposed to treat everybody and you do it one at a time. You just go out there and recognize, oh, this is what I need to do. Okay, so after all this, now Jesus tells these two parables, which tells you something happened in this story that he wants people to make sure they understand. So now he tells these, these two parables. Luke 13, 18 and 19. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like and what can I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. Wow, okay. We have one little seed. It becomes this great tree 
And that tree is a place of rest. It's a place where people, birds, get a chance to come and make a home. This one little seed made a corner of the world a safe home in which to live. In this context of Jesus healing this woman from this disabling spirit, releasing her from that bondage, the safe home was about winning the spiritual battle. Okay? And so when he tells this story, it's about the kingdom of God is like this mustard seed that becomes this safe home for anyone out there who needs a safe place. So this mustard seed is also about extending the kingdom. It's not about just right here. It's about making it big enough, arms open wide, and welcoming anybody to come and say, hey, I'm safe. You're safe here. Come to this place. And that's the kingdom of God is like that. And again, it starts out as a small, inconspicuous seed. Okay, little tiny little thing. But then it gets big, big, big enough that whole other people, birds, whatever, get to come and say, okay, this is the place I want to be at home. Then the second parable. And again he said, what can, I, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. Several, several things here to, to look at. Here, here's three things. Look at the transforming power of the leaven or the kingdom of God. 50 pounds. We talked about bringing in a 50-pound bag, but I, I carried two 50-pound mortar bags. I had done with any 50-pound stuff this, this week. Okay, so, but, I mean, you think about it. Itty-bitty leaven, 50 pounds of flour. It's going get, to get through this. So there's a transforming power of the leaven. Second thing, the kingdom of God, it starts out small. It starts out small and works its way through society, through the world, until it permeates everything. And the third thing, this is also an analogy about winning the spiritual battle. So, let me talk about each one of these things. Transforming power. People in the kingdom of God... If you're a child of God, you've got to be transformed. You can't, can't stay the same old person you used to be. Transform. This means you must not stay the same. You know, I must grow more and more like Jesus. I must reflect Jesus for the world to be able to see that. And then my transformation, because I changed, well, that ought to affect all the people around me too. It, and it influences whether they start to grow or not also. I mean, and that's part of that leaven. So as far as the uh, next fill in the blank, I want to be transformed into God's kingdom. And that, that's, that's who we are as a people. We want to be transformed. That has to be, you can't want to stay the same. You want to be transformed into God's kingdom, into something bigger than yourself. Now, earlier I talked about, you know, the kingdom of God, it starts out small, it started out, started out long before Jesus came, but I'll start there. Jesus came, and he's talking about this kingdom of God, and he's saying, the kingdom of God is now. It starts with Jesus and his teachings. Then, when he leaves, the several people who heard his teachings, it's up to them to spread that to several more people. And then they spread that to several more people, and pretty soon, it's all around the world because it's disciples who make disciples who make disciples and that's what's supposed to happen in the church setting. So the last fill in the blank, I want to make disciples for God's kingdom. That has to be a goal for the follower of Christ. None of us are supposed to be content with, hey, I'm saved, my wife's saved, family's saved, we're good. It's about making disciples who will in turn make more disciples. It's always about sharing that testimony. Being that witness for who Jesus is. Letting people know, I'm going to live my life different, here's why. It's got to happen out in the world. And then that whole idea about winning the spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle going on right now for your soul. Just leave it there. That's it. 
there's a spiritual battle going on for your soul, which means there's a spiritual battle going on for every soul in the world. Do I recognize this? Am I helping God's kingdom when it comes to that? I mean, I mean kind of like, well, you got to decide which side are you going to be on in this spiritual battle. If you haven't chosen sides yet, then you've already chosen sides. Here, uh, I might have told this story a long time ago, but that just means I'm the only one that remembers it, so I'll tell it again. Uh, long time ago, I mean, over 30 years ago, working in a church in Illinois, and uh, there was a, a, a youth that had, had, uh, ran off the road uh, late at night in the middle of the country here, uh, ran off the road in, into a ditch. And, you know, he was telling uh, the, the police that showed up, ah, you know, there's an animal on the road I, I swerved to miss. And, and, and he didn't pass a breathalyzer test. So it probably really wasn't an animal. He was, he was uh, intoxicated. So the mom um, wanted me to go talk to this person. And, uh, and, 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 and here's my thing. That's fine, but this person didn't want to talk to me, which makes it kind of a wasted effort. But, you know, kid comes in. Uh, <laughs> where's Joel Mishler? Oh, yeah. Eye to eye, eye to eye. No eye contact, buddy. <laughs> I mean, it's like head down. I mean, I've known the kid for, you know, I don't know, four or five years at that point. Head down, not going to look me in the eye ever, you know. And, and so I, I, you know, so there was just no, no, I mean, it's like, bring the kid in, but if the kid doesn't want to talk, kid's not going to talk. So, so basically then, um, I just asked him, so what are you going to do next time? I mean, are you, are you going to, are you going to drink? Are you going to decide to drink? And his response was, well, I don't know. I'm not, and I, what I told him was this. Since you're already on that path that you've decided you're drinking, if you're unsure about what you're going to do next, I can tell you what you're going to do next. And that's what, you're going, to drink, you're going to keep drinking. You have to make the decision not to drink in order to not drink. You can't decide ahead, like, well, I don't know. We'll just see what happens in the next situation. Dude, it's already decided. And, and what's, what's important to recognize with when you think about the spiritual battle, if you don't think there's a spiritual battle, you're in trouble already, okay? Because there is a spiritual battle for your, for your soul. And it has to do with the enemy, and the enemy would be like nothing more than for you to think, ah, there's no spiritual battle. I can do whatever I want. It's fine. And all that's rubbish. You've got to decide which side are you on on this spiritual battle. Undecided means you've already decided. There are no sideline players in the spiritual battle. Everyone's on the front line, and you need to understand that and make sure you take sides. So when I look at, at what's going on in this passage, Jesus does on the Sabbath what needs to happen on the Sabbath, healing, setting free. He does what he can for the person who's right in front of him who needs it. And this serves as an example for us in the, in the present day. Then he shares Two parables. One that shows the kingdom extending out beyond ourselves and out in the world. And the other which shows how the kingdom is now and it transforms people now. And we need to be those people. And again, when they talk about leaven uh, expanding and all that, yeah, the kingdom's now. You look out in the world, the, king, the world doesn't know that. And that's where it's like it's enfolded in there. It just hasn't permeated all the way out yet. And that's where it starts small, but it's going to continue to grow, going to continue to grow. And inevitably, it will grow and get out there, and Jesus comes in glory and returns and all that. And in the meantime, it's up to us to be part of that leaven, uh, be transformed, make a difference in the world, uh, treat what we can do for anybody we, we find, and, and allow them to discover and experience Jesus' healing touch in their lives. But that only happens if we can let them know who Jesus is. At uh, this week, 
this week you've also got that an opportunity on Thursday uh, evening, uh, afternoon, evening, be able to come to the church. We're not going to have a Monday, Thursday service like we've had in the past. There's no meal. But, but in here there will be some stations to do some reflection, uh, prayer time. Uh, you can bring children. That's, that's fine. Um, and, uh, and then there will be a chance to have communion with Nick or I or, or both, depending on how many people are here, and, and, and prayer time. So I encourage you to be able to, to come and, and do that. Um, in, in a letter that came out this week, there's some scriptures that talk about what happened during Jesus' last week of life and all those would help prepare you for uh, Thursday if, if you come to that. Um, and then also the, the idea of Good Friday, Jesus dying for your sins and, and mine. And then Easter morning, there's, there's a breakfast and just encourage you all to be able to be a part of that. As, as I close the, the service and with a prayer time, um, also could give an invitation. At the end of that prayer, if you'd like to, to come up and you feel like you need to be healed or set free of bondage or need to be emboldened to live more for Christ, come on forward. Uh, Nick and I would be glad to, to pray with you. I've got some anointing oil. We can do that too. Uh, so please bow with me in prayer. Lord God, I want to thank you for the way that you are here. I just ask for your blessing upon each and every person who hears these words. I just... I just pray for your touch, your Holy Spirit, your blessing. Hold us in, in your hands. Help us to be transformed. Uh, fill us with, with that desire to share and make disciples and to love the people out there who seem unlovable, but you love them. Bless us now. I just pray for your power to be evident in people's lives and people to be transformed and healed. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Uh -huh.